you must grapple with this fundamental question. Which came first, the universe or the information? Now, what I've noticed lately with my, uh, with my colleagues is that they kind of cleave on one of two axes. They either reject completely the notion and find the notion of God so anathema they won't even treat it. They'll treat it as a three-letter word. You know, it's, it's almost as if the, the, you know, a four-letter word is almost uh, too, too, uh, too much encomia to, to provide to such a concept. So they'll treat God with, with so much disdain. Uh, on the other hand, there are those that will embrace it, such as Michio Kaku, who I've had on my show, and about which Stephen and I have much to say. Um, or uh, in his new book, The God Equation, which ends with the very same words that Stephen Hawking's apocal book, A Brief History of Time, ends with, which is once we obtain the final theory of everything, not guaranteed to exist, by the way, but once we do, presumably in string theory, his pet theory, uh, then we shall know the mind of God. We hear from your countryman, the late great Paul uh, Dirac, we heard that God is a mathematician of a very high order. We hear of the God particle, the God equation, the mind of God. I hear about it so much. These are God-saturated people. And even your very own Fred Hoyle, who I am one degree separated from, courtesy of the office that I have at the University of California, San Diego, once held by Jeffrey Burbage, uh, who is Fred Hoyle's uh, great, uh, great colleague and a giant Narlikar, who is Fred Hoyle's student, who I've interviewed on my podcast. Uh, these are steady state theorists who used to claim that cosmologist only adopted the Big Bang, Justin, if you can believe it, because they were overwhelmed by Genesis 1-1. So I came to become puzzled. Which is it? Are we atheist or are we theist? And if you read this uh, literature, you come to the notion that we are deeply, deeply uh, schizophrenic, or uh, in other words, we can't make up our minds. And I think that be belies sort of the, the incipient paradigm shift that we can't really explain this fundamental chicken or egg problem of which came first, uh, a universe or nothing? Which came first, uh, atoms, matter, or a mind? Uh, which came first, the information or the, you know, the blueprint itself? And I think that's why Stephen's book is so vital. If it isn't correct, as I say, um, it makes you, it forces you. It's in inescapable. Like Einstein's equations themselves, they encode within it the way to do the mathematics that lead to the equations of curved space-time. Stevens lays out a blueprint. You may not agree with it, but you have to confront the airtight logic, and you can replace it. Actually, I've, I've confronted it because it is, so, uh, it, is, it is so engaging, and it's hard to think that a book, you know, 579 pages is a page-turner, uh, but it is. Um, and in so doing, you must grapple with this fundamental question, which came first? the universe or the information. And I've spent a lot of time thinking about that. And the conversation continues because there are those that say, perhaps no, Stephen, and he knows this, uh, the information is not all that finely tuned. And perhaps that is a valid objection, but these are open questions. And again, uh, my job as an experimental cosmologist, it's been said that there are mysteries in life and there are puzzles in life. Uh, um, a, a puzzle is something like a Rubik's cube. You know, I might not be able to solve it. You might be able, not be able to solve it, but, but Steve can solve it, you know, because he's super smart, right? So somebody can solve a puzzle, but a mystery, ah, that might not be able to be solved. My job as an experimentalist is to turn as many mysteries in the universe mm -hmm. as there mm -hmm. are into puzzles. Into puzzles, that's good. That's what I want to do. And I want to do it with data, and I want to do it while I'm alive to do so. And so to have these blueprints, to have these burning questions, it's a fascinating time to be an experimental cosmologist because we can actually do it with data. And so that's what I'm looking for. Are there signatures, not in the cell, but in the cosmos, that we can look for not to prove our theories, but to disprove alternative hypotheses? That's what makes my job so exciting. I, I, I mean, do, do you feel, Steve, that the, the Hawkings and the Krauses and, and others who arguably have been more wedded to a sort of naturalistic approach to things, kind of they, they have their own sort of outcome which they're headed for whatever the, the the physics or the maths tells them that that they're, they're always going to be looking for a conclusion that in a sense excludes god i mean is that is that arguable well I, i've often I, I mean i really i really am uncomfortable uh assigning motives to alter people with alternative points of view because i think you have to settle to the extent the issues are settleable 
Uh, you have to settle by appeals to evidence and to reason. Uh, but there is a phenomenon in, in uh, especially in theoretical physics and some of the, the subjects that can't help but come up against these big questions, a phenomenon that is sometimes called the God-obsessed atheist, you know, the, 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 the strident atheist who also can't stop thinking about these big questions and, and in raising God-like types of concepts. Um, one, just pick up on one of the things that Brian said about the, this uh, idea that, well, you know, there's some people that say maybe the fine tuning isn't that finely tuned. Maybe the information is not fundamental. One of the things that really inspired me to write the book was the realization as I've studied the, both the biological evidence and the physical cosmological evidence is that there's something kind of incorrigible, incorrigible about the role of information in the universe or the role of fine tuning. There are these now multiverse hypotheses that are, have been proposed to explain the fine tuning. And I think it's the go-to atheistic explanation right now. It's the, there, are, there are physical reasons to consider the possibility of a, a multiverse, but I think the popularity of the multiverse is directly a consequence of its role in atheistic apologetics. And I think that's in a way speaks to your question. But what's interesting to me about the multiverse hypothesis is that for the multiverse hypothesis to work, um, you can't just say, well, there are all these other universes out there that are causally disconnected to our own. You have to show that the universes, uh, that there, there's, uh, otherwise the things that happen in those other universes would have no effect on what's happening in our universe, including whatever process it was that set the fine tuning parameters. So to, to in virtue of that problem, multiverse advocates have proposed various universe generating mechanisms. And what's interesting about those universe genera re generating mechanisms is, is that even in theory, those mechanisms require prior unexplained fine tuning to render plausible the idea that they could generate new universes. So even the multiverse doesn't really get you rid of the fine tuning problem in the same way that the, um, the, the, the quantum cosmological proposal doesn't get rid of a deeper kind of fine tuning or information, the information that's needed to produce a mathematical outcome that can function as an as an explanation for, for a universe like ours. So there's something incorrigible about the need for specificity and in information. And every attempt to explain it requires either a mind or prior unexplained specificity and in information, fine tuning. And I think that's that's something. I um, I had a line in the book talking about Einstein and when he confronted the redshift evidence, and I said that the universe. Uh, talked back to Einstein because initially he didn't like that idea. But I think the universe is talking back to us when we attempt to push the information problem, push the fine tuning problem out of view. It has a way of popping up elsewhere. It's an incorrigible aspect of reality. And it's one that in our uniform and repeated experience, only minds explain. And therefore, I think that's a very powerful indicator of uh, or a supporting idea, uh, an idea in support of theism.